I'm Stephen Lacey, a senior editor with Green Tech Media, and I'm sitting down with John Zaransik, who is the vice president of AES Energy Storage. John, good to see you. Thanks so much, Steve. So I want to talk about your very large portfolio of storage projects. You have around 175 megawatts of projects installed today. You have a lot of years of experience. What does that portfolio tell you about the viability of storage and how those projects are operating that's today? A, that's a good question. I, I think one of the things it tells us is that storage is a viable alternative for power uh, services in a number of markets. So one thing that we've done over the last few years is we worked with uh, six different system operators, some of those in South America, some of those in the United States. We've seen storage add value in all of the scenarios where we've deployed it. It's commercially uh, successful, the technology has proven itself out, and we're seeing systems now scale to even larger sizes. What's your play in the U.S.? Where do you have, the, what markets do you have the most advantage and um, what are you trying to replace with storage? Yeah, overall, I think we're aimed at places where we need to look at better ways to solve the reliability concerns. And so traditionally we've solved that with power plants. In a lot of cases we've looked at resource adequacy coming from uh, building peaker plants. And so uh, these are units that we build, we have to pay for all year long, but in the end we really only use them maybe four, five, six percent of the year. So it's an expensive solution. It's generally one that um, doesn't comply with a lot of our environmental goals because those are still emission sources. Storage can do those jobs. They can perform all the time doing ancillary support jobs, reliability jobs, and also be available then for the peaking needs when you have those. So uh, recently you announced a new product, a modular lithium ion unit uh, designed to be competitive with those peaker plants. Um, what are you looking at in terms of cost of that unit and is it competitive with peakers today and where? Sure, yeah, and we, we call that the Advanceon unit. It's a architecture that AES has developed out of the, the six years that we've been working in grid scale energy storage. We've taken the knowledge that we built there and every generation we've um, looked at ways to take costs out of the system, looked at ways to improve the performance of the system. We have a, a controls platform that's been operating over those five years uh, at grid scale. And so we've packaged that all together into this Advanceon uh, core system that we sell. And that is competitive with peaking plants. When you look at the jobs that storage can do, um, the fact that can operate around the clock at essentially no minimum generating level, uh, with no standby costs, that it can be available for uh, minimum and off-peak grid support, it can be available for peak support, it can do balancing jobs and, and integration of renewables. Um, when you take that collection of services together, it, it's very competitive with peaking plants. So I know this is a relatively new product, but people out there who are saying, okay, this is competitive with peaker plants, why don't we see a lot more of them deployed in the market? Why is storage not replacing peaker plants on a bigger way than it is today? Yeah, well, I, I think you are starting to see that. So I, I think one thing we have to always remember is when people are talking about building a power plant, the cycle for procurement and building a plant is five years. Um, and so what we're seeing right now is, based on the successes that AES has had with its deployments and others in the industry that are doing large-scale energy storage, now we're starting to see very large-scale procurements of storage. So uh, people are aware of what's going on in California, but we have uh, Hawaii procuring uh, large-scale systems. New York has a number of procurements going on. And around the world, we see it in Ontario, we see in Germany, we see things going on in Italy, Japan. Um, so it, it is the lead markets have recognized the value that storage brings, the fact that these technologies are commercial today and they're being offered by uh, very strong companies, uh, and they're looking at, at substituting them in for the procurements of those power plants. And so that is going on right now. You know, one thing we've seen is um, to the beginning of storage, uh, excuse me, solar developers partnering with storage providers to provide an additional revenue stream for that solar project, whether it be ancillary services or you know, on the commercial level to help uh, folks reduce demand charges. There are all these interesting market plays that you can use with storage. On the grid side, does partnership with solar interest you? Are you doing anything in that? Is that something that you see on the horizon? Uh, it just depends on the, the market and the structure of that market. So we do have a number of places where we're working with solar partners. Um, where there's uh, either a requirement for them to, to have some kind of a, a stability or reliability reserve in conjunction with their solar facility, or where there's an opportunity to work together. So I, I think we will see that. We will work in that area. 
Um, in other places, people are solving some of those challenges as a grid level service. And so AS is working on both fronts. We work with the system operator or the utility, or we can work with the, uh, the specific resource. Um, today, one of the largest projects that we've done is actually uh, integrated with a wind farm in, in West Virginia. And so um, there are some advantages of doing that. We can take advantage of the fact that the grid infrastructure exists there. Um, we can put storage there at a place where we can use that grid infrastructure that we're all paying for in the transmission system to do multiple jobs. So that's a benefit to the customers. Um, and then we can also use it as a, as a point solution if there's particular challenges at that, at that spot. So a lot of people are talking about what technologies, what marketplace are going to help utilities meet new EPA carbon regulations. What, is, where, what role does storage play? Well, I think what we should be thinking about is storage adds an inherent energy efficiency component to our systems. It allows us to take advantage of the cleanest, most reliable units that are available in that moment and deal with some of the constraints that often drive us to using uh, more expensive, dirtier, fast start, fast moving units. And so as we move forward in, with these EPA regs, as we start to see uh, additional plants retire to meet those requirements, and we're looking at building new plants for adequate capacity to make sure the power grid stays on, storage is starting to enter the mix as one of the resources we can do. And so instead of building that next uh, combustion turbine, we can build a storage facility. It doesn't come with any emissions, can be sited in places that we couldn't normally put a power generating facility. It allows us to take advantage of the cleanest resources we have. If that's a combined cycle gas plant that's not working at its maximum output, we can give it a little more to do at the times when it ordinarily wouldn't have anything to do. If it's off-peak renewables, we can take advantage of those more fully by bringing them into peak. So there's a lot of ways that storage can support this. Um, that's kind of a, a direct way, but, but indirectly, the other thing that storage does is it provides a great deal of grid resiliency. And so one of the challenges that people often talk about as we push forward with uh, uh, low carbon energy is the challenge of integrating renewables into the grid. And, and storage provides a very flexible, fast, responsive tool for a system operator to make sure that they can balance the, the job of uh, bring more uh, low carbon energy in and make sure you maintain the same standards of reliability that we're accustomed to. So do you actually see it, that it will drive business going forward? Well, I think so. I mean, it's all part of looking at the grid mix of the future. I mean, we're very clearly moving down a path where we have more low carbon sources of energy. That's happening here. It's happening in a lot of places around the world. Um, as we do that, we have to look at what does the rest of the system do to compensate for that. Um, and so today, we have some very efficient thermal plants that we use, combined cycle gas plants are among the cleanest, most efficient generators that exist. We have renewables coming in that don't bring any emissions with them. And we need something that fits those two things together, that can kind of act as a, a, a utility infielder, if you will, you know, that can run around and make sure that both of those systems are used at their, at their best advantage. So we have seen some pretty positive cost trends in, in battery storage. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just curious where you think the technology in the, in the actual market play is going by the end of the decade in 2020. Uh, well, I think there's a lot of forecasts out there uh, of what people are saying. I think in general, we've continued to see in reality the costs beat the forecasts that most people talk about. And so I, I expect that to continue. Um, if we think about what happened with solar PV as a good example, um, that's a recent case where we have essentially a material science-based uh, product built in a factory that scaled up extremely fast and we saw incredibly rapid decline in pricing and it's at a scale that people really didn't expect. Um, now we have energy storage which is essentially material science-based product built in a factory that's scaling up rapidly and I think we're going to continue to see those kinds of declines and so Today, there's a lot of things that you can do at, at the current price points with storage. We're doing them and a lot of other people are as well. Uh, but going forward, we continue to see storage meet or beat all of the forecasts. And, and that just opens up an enormous amount of other jobs where it would make sense uh, to store energy and, and do those power jobs that way rather than build a new generating factory. Um, you know, the one way to think about this is most of the times of the year, we have uh, you know, almost twice as much generating capacity as we need. Um, we just don't have it at the exact moments that we need it. So the only solution we've historically had is build another generating plant for that peak, but, but most of the time we don't use it then. 
Um, and so this is with storage, it's almost like adding a, a warehouse or an inventory system to your manufacturing. You know, you don't, you don't want to just keep building production capacity. You want to use the production capacity you have much more effectively. So what storage does is it allows us to do that. It allows us to take advantage of resources that we're already paying for uh, uh, much more fully. Well, John Zarancic of uh, AES Energy, Energy Storage, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Stephen.